introducing everyone. Michael Meindl is an assistant professor at the School of Communication at Radford University and will and um, sent me a few ideas on spoilers in teaching. And then we have as our fourth or fifth, if <laughs> however you like to see it, guest, Eberhard Wolf. He's an academic associate at the ISEC Popular Culture as an Institute for Popular Culture Studies, where um, the conference is hosted together with Film Studies Department of University of Zürich. Um, and he had very original ideas on um, spoiling in academic uh, academia, but didn't want to spoil them. So Eberhard, I would be, I would just stick th to this and let you spoil your own ideas afterwards. So um, we will start with your short inputs, insights into your life, professional lives with spoilers. And Anna Smith, I would like to ask you to start. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of a conference all about spoilers, because it really is something that as a film critic, I feel quite strongly about. I'm that person that if people are having a conversation in the pub about a film and they've all seen it, but they I'm like don't tell the spoiler in case the next table might overhear it and they've seen that film so I feel that strongly about not spoiling films and I think probably my journey started when I was a student film critic at university and I wrote a kind of test review for the newspaper of basic instinct and according to them I spoiled the ending and that was a real learning curve for me I thought okay fair enough now I know most important thing Yes, good writing, but don't spoil the movie, especially movies with a twist. And I think that's, you know, throughout my journey as a film critic has been the interesting thing. Obviously, twist driven movies are the most critical film to observe the no spoiler rule. Um, but then it's up for you as a film critic in a way to decide what is a twist? What if there are multiple twists? What if there's some information relayed early in the movie? which um, is critical to the plot development, but doesn't necessarily spoil the viewing if you know it. So I think it requires quite a lot of empathy as a film critic and a lot of conversation with people and a lot of experience, I guess, um, to kind of figure out what is actually going to spoil someone's enjoyment of a film and interfere with it to a dramatic degree. Um, when I started out, there was a kind of rule that people said, well, if it's in the trailer, it's fair game. So this was something that I heard a lot. If it's in the trailer, that's fine. You can give it away. And I lived by that rule for a while. I started writing about film in about the year 2000. At that stage, that was a quite a good rule. Now in 2011, there's a film called Dream House uh, starring Daniel Craig, which was a supernatural thriller with a major twist that absolutely hinged on this twist. And the trailer for that gave away the twist. I feel so sorry for the director, for the actors, for literally everyone involved, because that completely spoiled the movie. Um, so then I had to abandon the idea of, if it's in the trailer, it's fair game, because that was no longer the case. So for me, it's an ongoing effort um, of assessing a film, of hearing from people on social media, of talking to people, to try to figure out what constitutes a spoiler. And as someone who hosts a podcast, obviously we have to be very careful about when we release a podcast and how many spoilers we give. Um, with your traditional podcast, if it comes out maybe two weeks after a big Marvel film, that's probably okay to flag a spoiler and do a spoiler. But there are some people that obviously are so obsessed with the film that they don't even want to hear anything about it before it comes out. So the landscape, has somewhat changed. But um, yeah, to summarize, I'm very spoiler aware and I love that you're doing this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. So I'm really interested to hear if um, Michael Senhauser sees it in a similar way or completely different. No, more, more or less it's the same. I, I started out earlier and I think the first time I came across a film that could not be spoiled really was the crying game in 92 when that was just about four years after I started out as a film critic professionally and then 
it was more of more of a challenge to me. I really enjoyed it. I I fiddled for about two or three days on a text about this film, trying out different ways of, of telling there is something without revealing what it was. So I I never had this fear of spoiling films because it, it had been more or less clear that you wouldn't give away a twist in a in a crime movie or something like that but the spoiler fear wasn't up in the 90s the second time of course was uh shaman six tens there it was clear as well and the only time i really just gave up was another shyamalan film that was the village in 2004 because that film really depends on that main twist that the the terror in this village is self-inflicted and if you don't give away that part of the film there's no way you can talk about what it is in any way and why somebody should want to see it so the film flopped completely as well i think that that was the main problem and the, the worst case for Shyamalan, because if if you have a film like that where you can't reveal the main drive of the whole idea there's no way you can talk about it. I, had, I just found no way of explaining to people why they should see the film, although I thought it's an interesting idea and very appropriate in 2004. And one last example with the spoiler is, is a local one. A couple of years ago when Lisa Brühlmann, one of our filmmakers, had her big first hit, Blew My Mind, I wrote in the blog and on our website and the radio website about the main protagonist who turns into a mermaid and that was clearly visible in the trailer you could see the protagonist in the bathtub with a big fish tail so i thought it's okay and i got a call from her and she asked me not to reveal that and i said i'm not going to change my text i think it's it works that way but I leave you the choice whether I can should publish it or not. So <laughs> took her, but I think overnight, and then she called me in the morning, okay, go ahead, please publish it. That's the only time I really had a direct discussion with a filmmaker. And the only time I didn't agree because I thought in that case, it's not really spoiling anything that's really important to the pleasure of the viewing of the whole thing. But all in all, I think until the, the real spoiler hysteria came along with, uh, with streaming and with the superhero films, it didn't concern me much. It, it has been second nature not to reveal too much. And with these films and these fears that have taken over now, it's a completely different game and we don't have to play along with all of it. I think we'll talk about the series a bit later. And I think there the question is entirely different. When we remember in Game of Thrones, for example, it's interesting to talk about spoilers in Game of Thrones, but that has nothing to do with the, with the film reviews. So I leave it at that for the moment. Thank you so much. I, I'm taking notes and there is a lot of things we have to talk about concerning film criticism. I'm very interested in the trailer question and as well in, in the question of series and what I thought was extremely interesting is what Anna said that um, you're always it's, it's a work in progress to find out how to write about spoilers and I think this is a perspective we actually didn't have um, until tonight so the specific um, specific perspective for, for journalism so we'll come back to that. But now we will switch to um, publishing books for children. And Julia, I would like, I'm very curious to hear what your experiences are. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'll start with a saying I learned when I first started out in publishing and it's a book dies in its own house. And when I learned that saying, it was uh, when I first came across spoilers in publishing, because as an editor, I'm, I'm buying the new stories and I'm the first reader. And yeah, I have to promote them to my colleagues in order to make them support the stories and, and the books um, as much as I do. 
So it uh, starts already in, inside the publishing house. And um, sometimes I have to reveal everything, like um, when I, yeah, in, in the most entertaining way also, because I, um, they don't have, my colleagues don't have time to read the manuscript themselves. And sometimes I, I have to be cautious and not uh, reveal too much so they could enjoy their reading. But um, yeah, that's just one aspect. There are of course many more aspects to that. And it's from the fear of spoilers before publication, for example, like when you send out uh, reading copies to journalists and bloggers and um, to the multiple ways children and adolescents talk about their favorite books in the end. And that certainly has changed with the, right of, uh, with the rise of worldwide best-selling series such as Harry Potter. You mentioned that earlier, Christina. And yeah, and followed by many other series after that. And I'll give you some examples. Um, so sometimes spoilers or the fear of spoilers is even used by marketing or public relations to create a hype in the media. For example, when a manuscript is sent out um, on very short notice to journalists and only to a few selected ones. Um, <laughs> So they, they kind of um, feel the hype themselves before they release their reviews. And um, this has become certainly more important with the rise of social media as well. And um, also as a publishing house, we highlight the spoiler potential of a book, like the exceptional plot or un unexpected twists that are to await in the story. Um, so we don't spoiler, um, uh, yeah, spoiler the story the, uh, itself, but highlight that there is potential to that and try to make it more interesting to both uh, reviewers and the audience. And, and spoilers, I think they have also changed the way manuscripts are traded uh, among publishing houses worldwide. So it sometimes it happens that I buy a manuscript and only like me and the publisher are allowed to work with it because it's it's going to be a worldwide bestseller and the release is going to happen at the at the same date. So all the other departments, production and marketing, and they have to wait until a very short deadline before they are even allowed to read it. Um, so the the fear of spoilers is even um, inside professional progresses. It's it's omnipresent, I would say. And then there's the spoiler problem with other professionals like booksellers and, and bloggers, for example, because they also, they happen to be fans as well. And they almost have to be spoiled by us because they need to know the story so precisely and in, in all the details. So um, they can't obviously not read every book by themselves. And um, also they, they need to be convinced to buy the book in Staples, so uh, booksellers, for example. Um, and before even some stories are, are ready to send out. So, and, and another aspect in publishing is the use of spoilers or maybe rather triggers inside the stories. With nowadays over 5,000 new publications in children's and YLA literature, and that only in the German speaking countries, um, it has become more and more important to stick out. So the and the publishing house's patience to um, to establish a new series has declined over the last decades, from what I observe. So it's maybe it's only half a year, and the series or new series has to make it in bookshops and um, has to be noticed by fans. And if that doesn't happen, it won't continue. So um, and writers know that more and more, and I think it affects their writing as well. So they need to launch triggers or spoilers. Um, it's interesting what you said about the trailers because we do book trailers as well. And there is always the question how much you release or not. Um, and, and yeah, they need these triggers to keep, uh, to keep uh, the readers going and create uh, traffic with their stories on the internet. And that's especially with YA literature. Um, and then the most important thing is of course, how uh, spoilers matter to the young readers. And that's in a completely different way uh, than what I first thought. To prepare this conference, I um, consulted my test readers again and asked them what they think about spoilers. And I was really astonished to hear that spoilers often, often even motivate them to continue reading or even start a new series. So um, it kind of, they give some orientation about what is important and yeah, what's the cool series now, so 
And the younger ones um, among them, maybe the eight to 10 year olds, they even think it's better to know what happens beforehand because then it's easier to deal with tension and suspense. And that <laughs> astonished me the most. And yeah, of course, when when's the time for reading? It's often before bedtime and they better like to know the monster is going to die in the end. <laughs> so it, yeah, it, it, their, their pleasure of reading is, is somehow bigger. Um, and the, the sooner they know what happens, the sooner they belong to the fan club, and that's important in their peer group, of course. And yeah, for the older ones, um, suspense is not the only reason to read um, a book or a new series, and um, that astonished me as well. But um, yeah, I like that fact, because um, escaping into another world, for example, is just as important to them, um, and often the example for this was Harry Potter again. And, um, yeah, there, there seem to be other aspects about books or literary aspects that they worship in, in the series. And also among uh, children, especially children, the rereading of best liked books is very common. They do that all the time. And so spoilers won't keep them from reading and they enjoy, yeah, enjoy the book again and again because they forget some details and then they like to come back to their favorite um, chapters and yeah, and in the end, I would even say that spoilers, they make a series worth reading. That's what my impression was when uh, talking to them. And most children and adolescents, they, they still read physical books and not uh, ebooks that much. And internet or social media is it's not such a big spoiler point to them than what I first thought. But um, they rather use it for information or for joining them, um, yeah, for fandom. Um, and certain bloggers and influencers they follow, and those have their fan clubs and therefore also a big say in what there is new to read and what is cool to read. And the bloggers themselves, they are cool because they know the books beforehand and, and the readers know they are the ones who are um, yeah, allowed to read these new releases <laughs> and they have to wait for it. Yeah, and they know everything about them. Yeah, and with this knowledge also, they gain more followers. So for the older ones, especially this, uh, this results in a certain pressure to finish a series as soon as it is released or as soon as possible. Um, yeah, sometimes at night when they're um, yeah, at midnight or so, they, they are queuing in front of bookstores to get their books. And we even, we did one event where all the, um, the children were allowed to spend the night in the bookshop and invited the author to read uh, her story there. So, yeah. And, yeah, these are some of my experience with spoilers, like both from book production and from um, my experience with readers. And I'm looking forward to discuss all of this with you later. Thank you. They're very interesting points. Um, and, and thank you for um, sharing what your test readers told, told you. I think that's really interesting. And um, we had a discussion on literature and um, spoilers today. and. Lots of things came up again now, so we can have a nice discussion on that. But before we do that, I would like to hear what um, Eberhard Wolf has finally has to spoil about his ideas on spoilers in academia. You, you need to put on your mic. Now me, not Michael Meindl's statement. I thought we'd hear the people okay. who are who okay. are present if okay. Okay. would you like to hear the would you like to hear the statement first maybe maybe okay i that's Thanks. up to you okay so i'll read the statement this is um Mindel spoilers reflection on academia when thinking about spoilers as they connect to the academic realm we can think of them in at least two circumstances spoilers in scholarly writing and spoilers in the classroom I'll offer some quick thoughts on the scholarly writing side. I think spoilers are less of an issue in this domain since many articles, book chapters, et cetera, clearly lay out the films, television shows, et cetera, that are going to be discussed. This is usually presented in either the title or in the introduction or even keywords if included. Since a lot of film study scholarship focuses on case studies, these mentions in the title or introduction forewarn the reader that that film or set of films will be closely analyzed, which prob probably means that the spoilers are going to appear. 
Because of this, I think we can feel less guilty about revealing material in a scholarly article or essay. The reader knows what they're getting themselves into. A link between academic or scholarly writing and the classroom appears in the issue of analyzing and discussing narrative. If a scholar's argument revolves around unique narrative strategies, including endings, spoilers are likely going to be mentioned. Same with the classroom. If we are teaching students about how stories are told and the various options open to writers of film and television, we are going to have to give some examples. However, since spoilers are usually taboo, I try to be as upfront with my students as I can. This begins with a syllabus. For any film and screen studies course I teach, I provide the following disclaimer. Sorry for the spoilers. Please note that some spoilers may be part of this class. It would be difficult, for example, to discuss changes in storytelling without revealing surprising moments from films that you haven't seen. I will work to reduce the amount of spoilers, but know that they will pop up. As I state, I do not go out of my way to reveal spoilers, and I don't just throw them around. But how do I discuss narrative or even the history of various minoritized groups without providing examples? What would you lose in a lecture on LGBTQIA plus representation without mentioning the ending of Boys Don't Cry? Of course, not all spoilers have the same weight. How much do I spoil Truffaut's the 400 blows by revealing the ending of the film or lack thereof. I also think temporal distance is a factor. I feel somewhat less guilty revealing material from an older film that I do something newer. I definitely wouldn't give a spoiler to something that is still out in the theaters. I want students to engage with older films and I don't want to make them feel like they have been robbed of, of that first viewing. I do want to mention that this issue is something that really plagues me with my upper level classes. In those students read scholarly material prior to watching a film, most have not previously seen the film screened in those classes. As mentioned earlier, scholars have a bit more freedom to discuss elements of a film. Having students read about a film prior to watching it gives the material to reflect on, on as they watch which then helps fuel discussions. But I do feel bad that some of these articles give away information that may reduce the impact the film has on the student when they watch it. I wish I had the time to have them watch the film without reading something, then read something, watch it again, and then discuss it. But in classes that required me to get through a lot of material in a short amount of time, I do not have this luxury. I think for everyone, spoilers are tricky, a tricky thing to deal with. We're always walking the line. I think as a scholar, I'm freer to mention spoilers. In the classroom, however, I must keep a balance between teaching students about things like narrative and still giving them the opportunity to watch a large swath of films for the first time and gain the impact of watching it unspoiled by spoilers. Yeah, the unspoiled experience was an issue already today. And um, now, Eberhard, it's your turn. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it made some sense uh, you, you have read this first because I'm going to uh, go one step further um, out of um, movie and literature, popular movie and literature studies um, into the subject of uh, spoiling in academic content itself. Um, and because I'm, 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 I'm no, um, excuse me, I have a blackout. Uh, I'm not into, into movie, into movie studies. I'm an ordinary, I'm an ordinary, uh, cultural anthropologist, but when you, uh, distributed, uh, this, uh, the, the call for papers, I read it at the, uh, simultaneously, I was finishing an article together together with my uh, colleague, wife Iris, who is with us tonight. And, uh, and it was on something completely different. And I have to tell you this little story and it will, it will take some, some minutes to explain you how, we, how I came upon the idea that you can also um, 
put a spoiler alert, alert in an academic article. It was an article uh, about a, a photo. It was, and I can show it to you, it has nothing to do with movie studies. Um, it has to do with, um, excuse me, you see this photo? Do you see it? Yes. It's it's okay. It's an article on the on this photo taken in the in the children's hospital in Zurich, uh, 19, 1935. and it is an article about how uh, something in German we call Blick regime or in English gaze regimes or regimes of gaze uh, are constructed. And this is this is a, a this is a photo of a of a patient of a young patient in in the in the in the in the children's uh, hospital of, of Zurich, and he was taken as a, and this photo was taken of, of, uh, as an example of a person that is physically degenerated in the realm of the ideas of eugenics at that time, even in Switzerland, in the 1930s. And what we did in 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 this article is showing how this uh, photograph was used. Um, was used in, in education and in textbooks um, to show what a real degenerated young boy looks like. And, um, and in this article, we, uh, when we wrote this article, finally, we decided for a sort of a narrative in it. We started with, uh, the, with showing the photo. This is on the... Next thing, this is the manuscript. The, the article is accepted, but isn't isn't published yet. Um, we, we started to to show to show the the photo. We start to show the photo, and then asking the the readers first to have a look at the photo, and then and 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 and, and thinking about what they see on this photo, and do you, and whether they see anything specific or anything. Of some of some medical med, medical significance in this photo, and then we were telling all this story how this how this photo was taken as an example of a degenerated boy quote unquote unquote degenerated, and in the end and and we we developed the idea of how um, how how young physicians and physicians were educated to see in this photo a typical example of a degenerated person. Um, of minor, really of minor, minor physical value, um, and and then in in the end, when we had explained this all, we asked the reader again. So now, please have a look again. Have a look at the photo, and do you have a different look at at it? Do you see different things, like the things the then physicians in the 1930s and up to the 1960s saw in this photo, for example, the ears or the, the way he looks or the way he stands and even, and even his hair, even the way his hair falls, that all has been signs of de degeneration at that time, really. It sounds ridiculous, but it, it was so. And, and then we asked them to, uh, asked them to have, a, again, a look at this. And then having an idea how these regimes of gaze, how these blick regime are, are constructed and, um, and, 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 and sort of made, um, we call it Verstetigung in, 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 in German, how, they, how to, to make them um, constant, sort of constant. And then at the end, we were forced to write an abstract. And now I'm coming close to the spoiler, spoiler, spoiling problem. We had this. Uh, we had to write this abstract, in as as one has to do when you write an academic article, and basically we had to spoil. We had to to write spoiler, and in the end we decided, um, as you see above in the in the uh, to to to, um, to to write a spoiler alert um, next to the to the abstract, and then giving a note to the copy editor, um, this is meant seriously. We're not kidding. Um, and see, we have the upcoming um, conference on spoilers. 
and yeah, and uh, they didn't react yet. They didn't <laughs> colleagues. They didn't react yet. Okay. Uh, so finally, and at the same time, uh, I, I, I saw the uh, I, I read these uh, call for papers of the conference, and I had the idea. Wow, spoiling, maybe in academia, writing an abstract always is an act of spoiling. And this raises a lot of questions, not always problems, but a lot of questions on how to tell an academic story. And maybe we can talk about this problem I have some ideas, you might have some ideas, and maybe we can we find some time to talk about these, um, these ideas later that uh, spoiling also is relevant to different ways of academic writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is, we have such an interesting um, scope of aspects, and I think I just realized that this writing abstracts actually is always as well in my experience as well an act of spoiling because if um, somebody like me who was in journalism for 20 years and then um, switched over to academia, I thought this is impossible, how can they make me um, begin with my <laughs> with this. Exactly. Yeah, it's 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 not it's just the opposite of what I learned all the time. And I think the interesting thing is that we um, that Anna already mentioned storytelling, um, storytelling in film critics. So this seems to be um, one of the points we really need to focus on. But now, first, I would like to ask you um, ask you to ask each other about things that you wondered, things you were surprised, or you could relate to. Maybe a question to Anna. There's, there's something similar to spoilers for us, I think. I made it a point for the last 20 years when I went to the bigger festivals, especially to Gun, to read as little as possible about the films that I would be seeing there. Although the titles have been known a long time ahead, I really enjoy it twice a year to see films like Uncharted Islands to go into a, an open adventure. And for me, this has become a kind of a ritual. And it's only recently that I realized we don't have that too often. As most of the films we see, we read about a lot ahead. And most people don't go to see films unless they know a lot about it ahead, because that's that's what promotion does, that's what publicity does. So where are we in there? If we are looking for that kind of innocent pleasure of finding something completely unspoiled, and at the same time, it's our job to spoil it for everybody else by telling them what they want to know, it's a bit of a dilemma, isn't it? I agree. I, it's a conundrum, isn't it? I totally agree. It's like whenever I admit to myself exactly what you've just said, that I love to go and see a movie in my privileged position, completely sometimes not even knowing the director, not knowing the genre, knowing nothing about it. And I love that experience. It's deeply ironic that my job is to inform people in advance, you know, in order for them to go and see the movie. But we do have a very lucky position but I, but I also do think that um, some people are able to go by and I'm not a huge fan of star ratings but I think if someone sees a headline or a star rating and they go okay this critic evidently likes this film I'm not going to read the review yet but at least it's definitely got their seal of approval um, and then they can make an informed decision to go and see it or they might choose to read the review to find out more to make an informed decision to go and see it um, but I think that's perhaps where there's a benefit and there's kind of glancing reviews or kind of headline reviews rather than the more detailed ones. But it is, yeah, it, it's it's weird. I, I think we're, we're so lucky, aren't we, to, to have that 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 joy of, of just having a completely, you know, a surprise experience, really. Sometimes it's a joy, sometimes it's not a joy, but, you know. 
on, on the other hand, there's this this phenomenon of uh, like Baroque st storytelling. If, if you look, go back to, to Baroque literature, there you have the, the chapter titles that it tell you exactly what uh, mm -hmm. Grimmelshausen is, is going to tell you in the next chapter. This is the chapter where the hero will and so on. And we have same, same kind of thing with all the remakes. And I think there it works for us as well. We know the story and the only thing we're interested in is how are they going to retell the whole thing? So sometimes it's, it's part of the whole pleasure, knowing everything ahead and seeing the differences. Definitely. The, the familiarity, I mean, that's something we obviously, as you say, see with reboots, but superhero movies in general that are based on comics. And of course, the Harry Potter films, you know, we've spoken about Harry Potter already, but they it didn't do them any harm that all the kids going to see the film knew exactly what was going to happen. They just wanted to see how it was going to happen on the big screen. Um, but again, you know, you mentioned M. Night Shyamalan earlier, but, you know, Harry Potter films, they do have twists, but they're not twist driven. And it's about the experience, isn't it? And I think, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really interesting distinction. And a, a last point in, in that kind of universe, it's the, the multiverse stories the superhero films nowadays. I have a theory of my own. I think that works more on, on peer groups and fandom. And I think what's important to these fans is, is more like the first rule of Fight Club. You don't talk about Fight Club. So if somebody is able to spoil it, he's telling secrets that are just for those in the know. I think it's not really about spoiling the fun for everybody else, but revealing the secrets that there are really to be kept among the case of the priests. And I, th I think that's how, how the multiverse functions now, because ordinary cinema goers have long lost their way in, in, in the MCU. Totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And some film critics. I mean, it's hard to keep track, right? But I think <laughs> what's really interesting, Michael, is what you've pointed out there is, is how actually, I think, complex and self-policing um, the superhero fans can be, those that are, that are real fanatics, and how they really, really invest a lot of time and energy into preserving the first watching experience, but also preserving the canon and their peers' experience of it, which is actually, you know, quite admirable in some ways. Good, good point. So we have a very interesting situation. On the one hand, I mean, I, I, as a popular culture scholar, I try to, um, to build some theories while listening to you. On the one hand, there is the joy of the uncharted territory. And on the other hand, there is the joy, which is very well um, um, broadly discussed in, in um, popular culture studies that that it's all about um, repetition and variation and you want to know stuff, you want to experience, you want to see the details, you're a bit of a detective maybe yourself. So um, I would be interested to hear from you, um, Julia, in publishing for children, what kind of, I mean, you already mentioned some aspects of this, but what, what image of the reading child um, does the publishing house have i mean you said children like to to know what what's going to happen what they can expect but you were kind of surprised do you think there is consistent idea of young readers and young fans yeah of course yeah we are we are dealing with um, an age variety between like six and 14 year olds and that changes uh, quickly according to their age i think uh, the children that want to know most of the plot or the series I observe are the younger ones because it seems to be comforting to them to come back to a world they know and it is also part of uh, how we um, design new series or new stories together with authors so every every book has an adventure um, that ends in this volume and then uh, the next one has a similar adventure so for example a series called 
uh, beast quest. And, and like in every book, you have to fight a beast and the beast dies in the end and the next book is the next beast. And if you continue this for a while as a smart reader, you know very soon that in every book, the beast is going to die and you have nothing to fear of. But still it's, it's thrilling to come back to it because they want to know how this happens. And um, to the, the older readers, I think they are more annoyed when there are the spoilers around and um, they try to avoid it more. And but also this is, has both sides. So um, one aspect is of belonging to the, the peer group or belonging to the ones who know, who know it um, and can talk about it. Yeah. So I think there is not a one consistent image of the reader, but it, it changes with uh, the age a lot. Yes, so I was just wondering about the, the reader of academic papers, Eberhard. Um, you, I mean, it, I, it probably depends a lot. Your example is a very special one. And, but would you still, would you say that there is, um, that could you make the assumption that academic writing takes away the joy of, storytelling for the writers and for reading stories for the reader? Would you say something like that? Or did I get it completely there, wrong? There, there, there might be, there might be, there might be. I was, when, when, when I prepared my statement, I was reminded of uh, something I was told some decades be, uh, be, before when I, when I uh, attended a, um, a paper of a, um, old television professor, a scientist, and he started his talk in in any quotation how to give how to give talks. He said it was it was told by uh, told to him by a Baptist uh, preacher, and but it's a it's a very common saying. Maybe um, uh, some of you uh, already know it's it's how to give a talk or how to give a sermon, and the the quotation is very simple. You might know it. Uh, it's it's very easy. It has three parts. And first, you tell them what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you've told. told them. <laughs> and this is a quotation that, that dates back to the early 20th century and was first found in an, in a, in in England in a Durham newspaper on the title, as as I uh, as I found out. But is it was sometimes it has been um, attributed to Ar Aristotle, but that's not true. Um, I guess in this quotation you see a sort of an archetype of the boring of 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 of, of something that is in in itself has a sort of a dialectic. It is when you when you listen to a to a to a paper or you read a paper or listen to a talk that is um, that has a construction like that, and I like that very much. I have to uh, I have to confess. Um, I know what what I will uh, I will expect. I'm I'm told what it is all about. I get the orientation. Um, I have an over I have an overview, um, and in the end, um, um, it is all repeated, and I can sort of uh, sort of of, of check whether I have really got it. Um, but on the other side, it's boring. It's <laughs> really, really boring and, and little narrow. And what we tried in, the, in this article is to go a little bit beyond this and to have a sort of a similar, a different, different uh, approach to academics um, in, 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 in respect um, 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 of, 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 of academic writing not in stating things, but ac academic writing as a process. And there's a famous saying by Heinrich von Kleist, the, uh, uh, the German 19th century literate, who is in the German original. He, uh, it's very famous. It's the das allmähliche Verfertigen der Gedanken beim Reden in English. It's a, it's a, uh, the uh, when you, when you talk uh, you 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 develop your thoughts step by step while talking like a little bit like that. Um, das das um, verfertigen der Dank Gedanken beim Reden means means um, thinking, talking, and even writing represents a process, 
and you have a tension within it. And here, um, media studies and film studies um, um, are getting, I guess, are getting more important, more interesting for, for us again, because they are talking about plots, they are talking about storytelling, they are talking ab uh, about something all the afternoon we have been talking about, about uh, suspense. And I would take it a little bit differently. I would have always have in mind um, the German term of Spannungsbogen. I don't know whether it is, it can be, it can be translated into English like an arc of tension, like the, like, like the, the concept of an argument that begins and has some logic and come to an end. And it's term Spannungsbogen also, it's not just, it's not just a sort of logics and one follows the other as it, as it has to be, but it also gets uh, academic uh, thinking also gets, um, um, has a little tension in it, like uh, an argument with a thesis and an antithesis and a synthesis uh, in the end. So it's it's not like it's, it's academic um, arguing is not not just like telling what you're going to tell them, tell and then telling what you've told them. It's even more, I guess. So it's much more related to writing or talking about film in podcasts, writing about film in in um, blogs or newspapers. Um, than we maybe thought in the beginning of the discussion. So um, I think we have to talk about one thing because right now on, on the, in this round table, um, our, we really have a very, let's say, um, positive attitude towards the spoiler or I mean, we think it's something productive in a way. And on the other hand, we, already discussed today uh, in the afternoon that spoiler phobia, spoiler alerts, they, that they're also um, a difficulty for actually having interesting discussions on, on film, literature, that talk, talking about plot all the time and plot twists takes away a lot of important aspects of um, art and popular culture because you don't talk about the poetry, you don't talk about the aesthetics and things like that. So I would, it would be interesting to hear from the film critics um, point of view, how you deal with this. I think Michael first, he's got his hand up. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's I th think there's, there's one thing in the perspective we haven't touched upon that that's the, the aspect of time and sophistication. If I recall the 70s with the first really big, almost global soap operas like Dallas or Dynasty, the, there was a time when you could buy mugs and t-shirts with the question, who shot JR? So that was the big cliffhanger at the end of a season of a, of a really primitive series. And we have come far from that. I mean, in between the series we have now and those from the 70s, there has been David Lynch with Twin Peaks, where I think that the strategy against spoilers was simply keeping it so much in the shrouded mystery that you couldn't really spoil it because question follows upon question there. And that works up to up to today with, with those films. Even he could even have a film sequel then. I think we were we are at the point now where, where things just have sped up. So it, the way Netflix works and all the other in the streaming wars, they need cliffhangers as well. But the cliffhangers follow so closely each on the next that it has become much more difficult. Um, the last example I recall on a big scale was the, the so-called Red Wedding in Game of Thrones. I mean, that, that was kind of a, a season's peak and everybody was talking about that and it, it brought hundreds of thousands of viewers to Game of Thrones that weren't interested in the whole thing before that just because the buzz was so big and everybody was talking about this red wedding. So I think th th there's a kind of a mechanic behind the whole thing that has heated up and, and 
I think even though this, the spoil of fear might have grown, the need for spoilers has become bigger as well. So we're, we're in a kind of inflation for the whole thing and, and we're playing the game along. Yeah, that's an interesting response. I think I'm still more spoiler allergic than you, actually, Michael. I'm, I'm still kind of nervous for the your traditional film viewer. I mean, uh, uh, when Christine was asking just now, an example sprung to mind that I, I reviewed a film called Monstrous, um, starring Christina Ricci, which is just premiered at Glasgow Film Festival. And I had to review it for Deadline Hollywood. And I, it's not a spoiler to say this film has more than one twist. So this was... a as you were talking about with The Village, a massive challenge for us, okay? So this is sort of your nightmare job as a film critic, much as I love my job so much. When you're trying to get 500 words out of something and not refer to the most interesting parts of the film, it's a massive challenge. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like for me, my job with this was to try to juggle that, that difficulty with the needs of the reader. And, and what I did with this one is I actually, which I rarely do, but I sent a review to my editor and I said, well, you haven't seen the film. Sorry for any spoiler I might be exposing you to, but can you tell me if you can guess the twist from this review? And she read it and she kind of half guessed it. So then together we finessed the review and we took a little bit out so that I think it won't spoil it for anyone. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but that just sprung to mind. Uh, a question concerning that, do you, do you make a difference between different audiences or do you just have a kind of a general public? Because whatever I do on radio is completely different from what I'm doing in writing and online. And it also depends on the films or the series. I, I, I react completely different because I, I expect a different audience. Yes, I think you're right. Because in radio, I mean, you were talking about older films, historic mm -hmm. films. I'm very aware that when I'm talking on certain radio shows, there might be young people who haven't seen a classic movie listening. Whereas if I'm writing for Deadline, it tends to be a quite engaged film, you know, centric audience who will probably know the end of the crying game, right? Um, so I think it is really important to bear different audiences' mind at different times. And I presume you seem to be doing the same thing, yeah. yeah. So, in, yeah, I see that, um, people are starting to ask questions and I feel the vibes from um, Simon Spiegel for quite some time. So let's just open up <laughs> the discussion and um, everybody can ask questions who likes. Uh, the first one would be um, Thomas Christiansen. Uh, hello, am I going through? Yeah, ah, perfect. fine. Uh, Thank you to all of you for uh, coming here and sharing. Her. It's, it's so interesting hearing your kind of inside view on, on some of these things. And I, I have a question that's mostly geared towards the, uh, the movie people here uh, and actually ties into a bit of something you just mentioned, Anna, about um, older films and spoilers there. Um, because I, for instance, remember... Uh, as a, I think I was a teenager. I'd heard a lot about The Planet of the Apes. Great classic sci-fi film. And I thought, I, I don't know anything about it, but I heard a lot about it and I will, I'm going to buy it and pick up the DVDs or order the DVD and picked it up. And on the box cover is the ruins of the Statue of Liberty at the beach. Um, uh, and after having watched the movie, I felt I was a little upset. Uh, I felt that I had been robbed of some kind of experience there. Um, but looking at a lot of classic films, I feel like it's sort of more permitted to have these very, very openly advertised spoilers. There's so many versions of Psycho on DVD or Blu-ray where on the cover you have uh, the scene in the, uh, in the bathroom where she's uh, stabbed, which is the big uh, shock moment and so on. So... I'm, I'm kind of curious, what in your estimation as someone who has to deal with these things professionally is the, I suppose, spoiler half-life um, of, of these kinds of things? When do we reach a point where it's acceptable to just slap a spoiler on the DVD cover uh, or have, you know, a, a pivotal dramatic twist scene featured in the screen cap used in the review or whatever it might be. When is, uh, I, I imagine it's not a hard science, but when is, when is the, 
in your opinion, in your, with your eyes, where, where, where does that limit of acceptability go? Firstly, if I may start, I think that's that's such a good question, and I and I I'm still quite absolute about it, and I'm I know a lot of people that are like you are quite cross about that spoiler on the cover of the DVD and all the posters, and I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. It's, I think you've identified something that in the past it wasn't such a big deal and it wasn't seen as a big deal, but actually it probably did bother people, and especially in the case of a film like that where it is a twist. Um, so I would, I, I, I'm quite hard line. I would, I would say in terms of marketing and terms of criticism, in terms of having a conversation with your friends, I'm constantly going spoiler, spoiler, shh, shh, you know, but you know, not everyone's going to be like that, but I think for maximum enjoyment, I think it should be avoided. I'm, I'm not sure. I think there, there's something like a canon and the classics. And I, th I can't think of anyone who will be upset if I tell him the, the main plot points of Goethe's Werther. So uh, I think Psycho is, is in that realm. Uh, spoiling Psycho is, it's a strange idea to me because if, if you don't know that film, you really, you're really just starting out and maybe you shouldn't read anything and just watch 200 films before you start talking about them. <laughs> I'm not sure how achievable that is, though. Yeah, I always I'm... think of like the 16 year old, 17 year old who's finally old enough to start watching these movies. Are they supposed to not read anything, not watch anything? Yeah, maybe you could just answer with Goethe himself, who said, you can only see what you know. So the more you know, the more you see when you read something. <laughs> no, that's a joke, but um, it's Simon's turn to ask. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I could. I could uh, respond to, to everything, but since I uh, regularly talk to uh, both film reviewers and uh, scholars, uh, I have a question uh, for, for Julia. So no, no, first, uh, first a comment uh, to, to Eberhard. I mean, well, what you said for me make, makes complete sense and it just shows that there's also a dramatic structure in academic writing. Uh, and I was reminded um, of an article I had to review recently and it was about it was about the movie. I actually forgot which one it was. Where there's a second version on DVD, and uh, the author will compare the two versions. And he says, "Okay, in this article, I'm going to compare two versions because there's a difference." And then he's going to explain what the movie is about. And then, and he always said about ten times, "And I'm going to compare the two versions, which are different this way." And when he finally came at that point, I was like, "Yeah, I know. You told us ten times. Now everything is like." It's not interesting anymore, and it would have been actually the point he, he made was was kind of interesting, but he built it up so badly because he always like was saying what he was going to do. And I mean, I mean, when I write, I will I will always lead the reader first. I do this, then I do this, and then the end I will do this. Uh, and I like to read that, but he did it so uh, so often and so badly that I feel like okay now I'm really bored because you already told me in advance. For me, this is really a lecture in that uh, there's also the dramatic structure in uh, in academic writing. But my question uh, for Julia is um, something which I thought was really interesting. You said that, especially like with uh, bestsellers and big books, that they're even inside the publishing house that there's the fear of of spoiling. Of, uh, uh, or, of uh, letting the information out. And my question, maybe it's a naive question is, why is that a problem for you? Uh, is there a fear that people will not buy it because of these spoilers? Because from my point of view, you couldn't care less. People will still buy the book. Yeah, but I, I need um, like the other departments to support the books uh, as much as, as I would because I need to, to raise money in marketing and I need the, the expensive paper, sort of paper chosen to, to print the book and I need um, special effects like glitter and all these um, additional elements to a book. They are expensive. So I kind of, I, I have to have the whole team like with me about the story. And yeah, but uh, if I answered you correctly, there's also the fear that if there's too much information getting out early, that this will somehow hurt the book. Uh, or, or oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, 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 but why? I mean, I don't think, I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, don't think it works that way at all. I don't think that anyone will not buy a book if he knows something about it in, in advance. 
yeah, but the book, it, it won't have it, um, um, a good position um, in, in bookstores and um, it, it won't get enough marketing. So maybe it won't even be found by the reader in the end because it has, yeah, it's, it's just the end of the catalog and, and there's not much advertisement. And, uh, and it's gone. Okay. Yeah. So that's really an interesting insight that spoilers are ac actually a marketing tool for publishers. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Um, Eberhard, would you like to comment on Simon's comment? No, I don't, I don't think it was the question. Thanks. Okay. Um, Christina. Oh, I feel like I'm the only spoiler file in this entire room. Um, and I'm I just want to say one thing about I the film. You, Christina, all the way. <laughs> I just want to say one thing about the film. Um, I, I totally, I totally hear what you were all saying. Um, I taught the crying game a while back, and I actually timed it so I could see um, how long the Irish terrorist part was, how long the trans part was, and how long kind of the merging of the two plots was. And I was utterly surprised that more than a third of the movie actually took place in Ireland before we even get to Dill and to, and to London. And what that meant for me was that this big, you know, oh, the big spoiler, the big surprise overshadowed the entire, what I thought was actually a much more interesting part. Um, the transphobia of the early nineties kind of, you know, pushed this, this, surprise, surprise, oh my God, you have to see this so much into the center that the actual, the actual movie kind of, kind of, you know, was pushed aside and a lot of the, a lot of the content of the movie. So um, I do want to push back on Eva Hart's comments because, um, and I, I say this as someone who was raised um, in the German school and university system and then um, started teaching English and English composition, which every person who studies in an English department in the States, as, as those of you who are in languages probably knows, um, has to do. And it didn't occur to me until I started teaching it that there's a very formulaic, there's a formula that gets taught, that gets taught in high school, like in the worst sense, you get the five pair five paragraph essay, but that continues on. And the abstract is a huge part of, part of that, right? The idea is we show you ahead of time what you're gonna hear and then you can decide. And we're all doing research. Like how many of you read an abstract and decide whether you're gonna read the essay or not, right? It's a, it's a tool, it's a tool in academic writing. And as, as fun as it is for me as an author to take my journey, to take my, you know, my audience on a, on a walk with me and surprise them and, you know, show them the beauty of my thoughts. Um, by the time I publish it, I should be, you know, reader friendly, as we say, my thoughts shouldn't be there anymore. And it should be so that my audience gets the main points. And then we can elaborate why I'm making this argument. So um, I, I don't think that the spoiler, um, the spoiler discourses were quite the same in academia. And our film critics already talked about different audiences. I think there are different audiences. And I think the academic audience by default should not, they shouldn't care about spoiling. I'm sorry, when I teach literature and I'm referencing texts that I assume my students know and they don't know it, I will give them the plot real quickly. And that for me is part of the education, right? Um, I took my son and I unspoiled, made him watch, you know, all the classical Hollywood movies so that, you know, he had that as, you know, cultural awareness, just like I made him read certain books. But when I get to the university class and you know I'm talking about Hitchcock and I'm talking about Psycho and they don't know what Psycho is about, yes, I will spoil them. I have no problems whatsoever. I wouldn't put that in any, in any, you know, I do, I do trigger warnings or content warnings or content notes, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna apologize for telling them, you know, who Agamemnon is when I teach the Iliad and who, you know. What happens in what happens in Psycho, and I'm certainly don't do it. Now this is students. I'm certainly not going to do it for an academic audience that wants to get my knowledge. And you know, like like the entire point is that we are having everything open and aware. Um, 
and, 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 and the flip side is, sorry, the flip side is how many movies I've watched because I've read film books about them. Like, like the entire like melodrama of the 30s and 40s, I didn't, I didn't actually, I wasn't interested in until I read, you know, film critics describing it and analyzing it. I'm like, oh, this sounds like a really exciting movie. You know, I still didn't like Mildred Pierce, but the reading was amazing, right? So, so there's like the flip side, where as academics, we actually gain when we spend more time with it and when we read the criticism about it. I, th I think you've just made an interesting point as well, because next to the spoilers, there's the announcement of possible spoilers, which, which can actually be as worse. Uh, as, as you said, with the crying game, if if we push up the, the audience expectations to a point where they just keep waiting for the Easter egg, they won't see the road they're going along. So, I, of course, that's that's something as, as a critic I keep in mind as well. So if, if I don't want to spoil something, I also don't want to announce there is going to be an interesting twist. I can do either or nothing. And, and so, as you said, with the classics, I think it's it's a lot better than just putting everything on the table and letting people choose whether they're still interested with the newer films and the series. It's, it's more difficult, of course, especially with those series that just work from one ending to the next. I mean, that, that's something we have talked about, but a lot of the new series only work from twist to twist. I I don't think I want to see Game of Thrones again because I've I've seen all the surprises. On the other hand, I wouldn't mind watching Breaking Bad again because it's well made and it's not just the surprises. But for Game of Thrones, once is enough. So, <laughs> who would like to react? Um, Simon. Yeah, maybe just uh, uh, still a uh, or oh, actually uh, about the uh, uh, film criticism. I mean, um, I completely uh, uh, agree uh, uh, what uh, uh, Christina said uh, uh, about no uh, uh, about uh, uh, academia. And I mean, Mike listened here, so I won't react to that. But I completely disagree with, with that statement. Uh, and completely, I think in the classroom, I can talk about everything, but. Uh, um, and I, I, I think it's actually a complete misunderstanding of what uh, we, we're doing uh, as teachers. Uh, uh, but, <laughs> but I will stop there. But uh, uh, when it comes to uh, film reviews, I, I think uh, Michael uh, and uh, Anna, I'm, I mean, I think there's an agreement that, uh, that uh, the whole fear of spoilers increased a, a lot in recent years. And the, the thing is, I mean, obviously, if I would have been a, a film reviewer in the 60s and wrote about Psycho, I wouldn't have written in my review, actually Norman Bates is the killer. And I wouldn't uh, write uh, in my review of Sixth Sense that actually the Bruce Willis character is dead all the time. But that's all actually not, not, you don't need to do that uh, in this kind of twist movie. You can perfectly write about this movie without giving away the twist. But what I'm seeing and what I, for me, is really something different that especially this big franchise it has reached a completely different level that you basically cannot say anything. Uh, and if, if I say actually in, in, in Star Wars, there are uh, people in planes fighting against other people, or not in, uh, not in planes, uh, in spaceships against other people in spaceships, someone will say, oh, don't spoil it for me, which to me is, makes no sense. Uh, uh, well-known colleague of yours, Anna, uh, in his review of the latest James Bond said, oh, I won't talk about plot at all, which doesn't make sense at all because in the in No Time to Die, there's one thing to spoil and that's the ending. Everything else is just regular James Bond. We all know what happens in a James Bond. And here, I really, I really don't understand where the fear is coming from or what you can actually spoil. If I say in the new James Bond, there's a there's this super evil guy and he has this virus and uh, a bond is fighting against him. That's not a spoiler. That's not something you wouldn't know in advance. I, I completely agree with you. I think it's, it's you know, you've highlighted that it's very, which we've touched on, but you know, what is a spoiler um, is something that needs to be thought about very carefully. 
And yeah, simple plot points to me, you know, that are, are, are clearly very obvious are, are not spoilers. Um, but I, also, you know, talking about how things have changed. I mean, I think it's important um, to talk a little bit more about the impact of social media, of YouTube, of people get, getting into a fervor on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok. Um, and that a, a lot of people actually now go, or who are very spoiler phobic say I'm staying off Twitter until I've seen the new Batman film because I don't want to know anything um, and, and that just highlights how big a role social media has played I think in this kind of phobia um, but also how that's fine if people want to self-censor then they can I mean I know that there are some people that wouldn't read my reviews of something until they've seen the film that's completely their choice. So, you know, that that's up to them. They have that, that, that movement. But, but touching on what, what was said earlier about the academia, I completely agree that film criticism is very different. And I write for more academic publications like Sight and Sound. Anyone picking up Sight and Sounds knows they're going to see a plot summary and they can read that or not read that as they wished. But yeah, of course, it's hugely important for the discussion. I think that's, a, that's an important point. I mean, especially these days, I just stay off the news two hours before I want to go to bed for the last 14, 14 days at least. And I think that's that's something we keep forgetting. You can do that. You can just you can just stay off news, Twitter, social media, anything. You don't have to read the reviews. Of course, you will stumble across something, but there's some things you just you don't have to do it so crying spoiler if you've just been looking for them is a bit it's part of the game and i think that that's again part of, of that priesthood i was talking about you're, you're you're not you're not really looking for spoilers per se but rather for people for people that are spoiling and you can accuse them for that i think it's it's become a kind of a sport as well yeah so it seems we really have different I mean, the question that Anna um, raised and repeated right now, we always have to think about what is a spoiler. I think that is really very relevant because for you, when you write about film, um, there is a lot of thinking about spoiling is really thinking about storytelling. The storytelling of the film, the aesthetics of the film, your own storytelling. So it's something very complex. And the things we were talking about just now, um, people on social media getting all worked up um, seems to be a different thing. But the question is, why is um, spoiling uh, twists, plot points, etc.? Why is this so very, very emotional? I really don't understand it fully quite yet. But now um, let me see who was first. I think um, Thomas. Uh, yes, it's uh, kind of elaborating on what what, uh, what Simon just just talked about, because I think that, and also what uh, Anna and uh, Mika mentioned, because uh, I, I I feel like sometimes the word spoiler is taken to include uh, what we mean when we say premise, um, where I really spoil as, as I'm really spoiling a James Bond movie by saying, oh, there will be a gunfight in it, um, where that seems to be a basic feature of a James Bond film, or at least uh, if you say, uh, what would be a good example? Um, uh, in if 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 you rent Fight Club uh, and someone tells you, oh, it's about some guys who start a club where they fight, uh, is that a spoiler or is it is it merely stating the premise? And I feel like that becomes really really tricky when a work, a lot of the dramatic impact or thematic impact of of a work really really leans into having uh a standard premise that is then kind of done something interesting with uh because again what's well i'm trying to think of a good example here um I'm, one of my favorite uh kind of comedy action films is big trouble in little china i think it's a wonderful film uh and it has a in many ways a very very kind of box standard premise but it does very interesting things with that premise and very kind of teasing and subverting things uh, about mainstream films with that premise um and is saying i, I mean wh where to, to what point can we say that just saying that about the film is a spoiler uh so so i think that whenever a premise of a film or a piece of literature is is very very kind of 
run of the mill, but what it does with that premise is then interesting. That's when it gets really, really thorny, trying to pick out what and what isn't a spoiler. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Does, does that make sense in a way or? Yes, it does. I, I think you can turn it around. If you're looking for that kind of definition of what it really is conclusive as a spoiler, you have, have to look actively for something. If, you, if I want to spoil a film or a book for somebody, what would I pick? And if I find something that completely spoils it for them, that's definitely a spoiler. Everything else probably isn't. <laughs> Any more comments from someone on this point? I'll just take my hand. There we go. Okay, so Andreas Rauscher would be the next. So thanks for this very interesting discussion. So. I was wondering, uh, is there a kind of adaptation of spoilers? Because I was thinking about uh, if you have uh, the plot twist taken from a literary source in literature or from a comic book, then it is adapted into the film. For example, Game of Thrones was mentioned. The people familiar with the books aren't surprised that uh, many people, main characters die. They would probably be disappointed if the series wouldn't. Uh, play uh, according to these rules. So I think also this kind of genre rules uh, play into the experience of being spoiled. And uh, I found it very great that Big Trouble in Little China has been mentioned. I think in regard to this film, there's also the discourse around the genre movies because John Carpenter integrated a lot of elements of uh, Hong Kong Wuxia films at a time around 1985, when this genre hasn't been really well known in the uh, Western uh, cinemas. So it was a little bit out of time. And so probably that was a surprising effect during its initial release. Yeah, I mean, if I may speak a little bit about the book adaptations, because I think that's, you know, from my perspective as a film critic, oh, yeah. that's a really interesting point because obviously, you know, I'm frequently writing about films that are based on books. And of course, maybe 30, 40, 50% of the people reading my review will know exactly what happens, but you've got to think about the rest that don't. And, and but also you need to give enough to the fans of the books to let them know. I think it's not a spoiler to let them know whether it's a faithful adaptation or not a faithful adaptation, I think. I think that's something that is useful information. I mean, Michael may disagree with me, but I think, it's quite helpful that if you're and, and, and indeed Julia, if you know if you're a fan of a book, if you're deciding whether to see the movie adaptation, you'd quite like to know how how well it, it you know abides by the literature or not. Um, and so that's yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting point. And I don't think that would be a spoiler, but I think um, yeah, I think I think to say what you might think was well known to readers um, would be a spoiler, just in case people reading it haven't seen the book. Thank you. Then, um, Christina. Hold on. Um, I'm actually following up on this. I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated with genre, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about this. But one of the things I've noticed is that when I look, when I watch old movies, um, they a lot of times seem so simple, right? Because they don't have the twist and the next twist and the next twist, um, because, you know, over time, um, audience expect certain things and they know, especially like in mysteries, right? We know this is going to be the person. So we, we're going to pretend that is the person, but it's someone else. And, and so you get like more and more twists and turns um, as, we, as we move on and our, our audience become more sophisticated. Um, but I think that's part of the question, right? And it goes back to Julia's point about how the readers would would figure out at a certain point that they're reading the same story again and again and again, which is part of, of a feature of, of these series, right? You want to read the same story again and again on some level. Um, but what does it mean when they are generic features in, in a film, let's stay with the films, that are very recognizable to anyone who knows the genre or who has been watching films for a while? Um, 
are those spoilers? I mean, that comes back to the James Bond, right? If you have an explosion in James Bond, that's not a spoiler, that's James Bond, right? Like when you expect certain things to happen in certain generic modes, um, what happens when the audience knows or doesn't know, right? Like how, how much should we expect the audience to, to be smart viewers, smart readers? Which yeah. comes back to why in my classroom, you know, they may be as stupid as they want to be and know as little, they're just going to be told. But, but that's because I'm teaching them how to see these things. Um, but, but what do you do? I mean, how do you, you, you both, both Anna and Michael talked a little bit about different audiences, but I think that may be part of it too, right? Like how, how knowledgeable are the audiences about certain, certain tropes, certain features, certain genre expectations um, that, that already may be spoilers, but they aren't because everyone should know to expect that. I think that that we've just seen that with the death of William Hurt, it has come back to me that the, the film Body Heat is his biggest hit actually in, what was it, 83 or something. Uh, that's a variation on double indemnity and the postman always rings twice. So these, these noir films that have been remade and remade and remade, a film like Body Heat works for a, for a first time audience on a completely different level than it works for, for us. If we, if we know film history, if we know the tradition, we, we derive a completely different pleasure from such a film. And I think that's, that's the part where you have to divide the audience. If, if you're writing or talking about such a film, you just have to say, now I'm talking about a cinematic tradition. I'm talking about something we've seen before and thus warn some people that maybe you don't want to go on reading now because I'm, I'm talking film history now because that's what really interested me. So I, I, I think that we derive completely different pleasure from this kind of films than somebody who's just watching it completely innocently. It's really interesting that that a lot I hadn't realized before doing this, but a lot of what we're discussing actually is very important part of our jobs as film critics and not just about spoilers, but it is basically about, in many cases, trying to assess what the reader or the listener or the viewer of the particular forum you're on might know, um, might be interested in might have a background in or might not have a background in. And, and balancing all those things plays into a lot more than just simple spoilers. It plays into the whole tone of your review and the whole um, sometimes angle of your review. Um, but, but, I, but I like that, you know, the spoiler thing has kind of put it into sharp relief. It's really interesting. Simon. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, just concerning um, adaptation of novels. I mean, we already uh, mentioned this uh, in the afternoon that Psycho is, uh, was an adaptation of a novel which was already in the market, I don't know, for several years. So actually the twist was already out. But the, the, and I, this is uh, more or less just a few anecdotes, but it's something I uh, came across just very recently, uh, the film Prestige, The Prestige by Christopher Nolan. It's based uh, on the book of the same title by another Christopher, Christopher Priest, which at the time it was turned into a movie, was already published for something like 10 years. The film actually changes quite a lot uh, in regard to the book. Um, and when the film uh, was uh, due to be out, uh, the publisher wanted to uh, re-release re the book and as they do uh, with a cover with uh, artwork from the movie, now a motion, mo motion picture, major motion picture and so on, we know that. Nolan vetoed that. He said, that cannot happen. I do not allow uh, that book to be, and basically he, because he said he won't uh, release artwork for the book, he, uh, he vetoed the publication. The publisher was not interested in, uh, uh, in reissuing it, it anymore because Nolan said, uh, no, I don't wanna have my film spoiled which is really crazy because they, they are different. And the interesting thing is in interviews, uh, he did like, he said two completely different things. He said on the one hand, no, no, the film is completely different. It's, it stands on its own. It has nothing to do with the book. But on the other hand, don't read the book because it could spoil the film. And it goes, uh, and it gets even crazier 
this is more or less public knowledge because priest has talked about this. And just by sheer coincidence, I got in touch with priest last week by email and we uh, uh, talked about this. And he said it was even weirder that during the shooting of the film, an actor was reading the book and Nolan forbid him to read the book during the shooting of the film. For reasons, I, I mean, makes no sense at all. Why shouldn't the actor read the book? But uh, that's, uh, that's how it is. <laughs> I, I think that's very meta. Uh, I think Thomas told the story before of, of his academic colleague who announced several times what he's going to talk about until it didn't work anymore. But if, if you take the, the prestige, that's actually what the magician does on stage. He talks about what he's going to do over and over and over until you just see what he told you he's going to do. It might be something completely different. I think with Nolan, it's something something on the similar level. He just, he, he makes so many promises. It doesn't matter as long as he talks about them. <laughs> he can turn it anyway. And, and if, if he says he's scared of spoilers, I think it's just pure marketing. Well, I love that story. Thank you, Simon. That was great. <laughs> I was very interested to hear that. You're welcome. <laughs> there is one more question by um, Matthias Brütsch. Yes, I wonder if you have any information about if uh, readers or, or listeners in the case of radio uh, actually um, um, read uh, reviews before they go to the movies or after. I mean, and I'm not talking about like the short reviews uh, with the stars, but like the longer articles uh, about films, also in film journals. Uh, and, and since the media are, are constantly trying to get information about uh, how uh, their consumers behave, I, I would imagine that they trying to get some information also about this question. And this would, uh, I mean, if, if you knew that uh, most of them actually read or listen to this uh, information after having seen a film, then you, you could write uh, or produce your, um, um, your piece in a different way. Um, and th that's actually how I behave. So I, I wonder if this is a minority phenomenon or not. I, I think it's, I mean, I, it, I, academics often do it that way, I think, and that, I think that's really interesting. Um, but what I would say is from my experience with broadcast, most people watch it before they go to see the, the film, because I, if I do a, a weekly film show on BBC News, people watch it on the Friday to decide what to see that weekend. But if they've got the luxury of a film magazine at home um, and they, you know, are a serious film fan, they, they may well um, decide to read it after they've seen the film. Um, but I wish there was the kind of research that you talk about. None of my editors have ever come to me with this information. But <laughs> Mikhail, don't you agree? It would be really useful to have it. You may have it, but... <laughs> no, research and radio is, is uh, simply ridiculous. I think the, the listeners that are accountable for our figures, there's some three or four people in Switzerland that are just adding up in the statistic. It's, it's, it's at random. But in my experience, it's the same. I think about half of the, the people that tell me they've listened to my film tapes or a short critique, a three minute, they say that was really interesting and it made me go see the film. And the other half of people say, now that I've seen the film, I want to hear what you said about it. So they're going to listen to it afterwards. So that's completely individual. But I think that choice has only become available for the last 15 years or so because now audio is not just fleeting it's, it's there it's there to stay as as text and that that has changed how people perceive that as well because as as long as you know that you can come back to it you can you can put it off and and wait and with with most what we do on radio i think People just choose either to wait or not to wait. And it's about half and half. Yeah. Uh, another remark, if, if I may, uh, before someone said that you, you almost can't uh, watch a film without having heard anything about it or read about it. 
Um, in a way, of, it's true that we are bombarded with information about all kinds of uh, films and series. But on the other hand, I think that uh, the choice we have with all the streaming platforms has become so big that very often uh, I just um, happen to watch something that popped up by the algorithm uh, and I'm just uh, starting to watch it to see if I'm interested without having heard anything about it. So I think it's this is the other side of the medal that uh, because um, the, the consumption is not so structured anymore with given schedules of, of TV and of film releases in the movie theaters, we also very often come across something that just pops up and, and, um, and then we read or hear about it afterwards. Well, that, that's your privilege uh, of, of the some five to 600 films I see a year. Some of them really come to me like that, but as long as, as my work is concerned, I just for efficiency sake, I usually have to inform myself beforehand just to make the choice. I mean, there's so many films that are just pushed now direction by the distributors alone. So we, we have to inform ourselves, is this going to interest my listeners? Is this going to interest me? Can I do something with that? Or is it just the next animal documentation that can do without me? So on a professional level, I don't have that freedom to to handle all the films like that as surprises that's why i like the festivals where i can but of course it happens to me as well i just, just click somewhere and i find something and afterwards i look look it up and see whether it makes sense to me or not christina i want to go back all the way to one of the first things anna said um that you worry about other people overhearing spoilers. And that actually reminds me, um, I'm in several fanish communities and we're very, very careful about not spoiling the show or book series or whatever that we're fanish about. People are really, really careful to protect each other when we're in different time zones or whatever. Um, where the spoilers happen is at the contact zones to other things. So I most often get spoiled actually um, in my newsfeed that comes on my iPhone, right? Like they, they, they don't care. They just have, you know, big plot spoilers of television shows that aired the night before. So I'm, I'm wondering how much of, um, of that change that we're all feeling, we're all describing and this, this feeling that there are so many spoilers is because, um, you know, we talked about the 70s and 80s. If I wanted to go to the movies, I'd pick up the newspaper and I would look at the reviews and then I would decide, but it would be me picking it up, right? It would be kind of pulling the information. Whereas the way social media work now is that it's pushed. So you're either on Twitter or you're, you know, on what, whatever social, I mean, TikTok is the worst. I actually, I was, as I was thinking about this conference, um, I'm, I'm, I'm watching a lot of TikTok, I have to admit. And one of the things that's fascinating is that in this culture, that is so, so worried about trigger warnings and things like that. I constantly get triggered on TikTok. Like, like the algorithm wasn't working that well yet. And so I wasn't getting the things I wanted and I was getting stuff that, you know, really triggered me. And I was really surprised that, you know, this is like the youth medium. This is, this is what the so, kids so, are doing. Sorry to interrupt, but you said you spoiler file. So TikTok has just found out about that. Well, it wasn't spoilers. That's so I'm a little, I, it was a lot of, I, I was watching a lot of puppy videos and they had a lot of dying puppies suddenly. And so, so that was really like something I didn't want. And I wish I could have like not seen this. I would have had the choice to like decide, but yes, you, you, you yes, you are right. No, but it's, it's, what I'm trying to say is that I think because of the way social media work and social media is pushing instead of us as, as audiences deciding what we see, that we just kind of get all the tweets of everyone we follow or even strangers tweets, right? Just thrown at us that the spoiling doesn't occur from inside the house. It occurs from the outside a lot of times. It occurs from people who are not worried about, you know, they're not fans of our of our franchise or they people sitting next to us in a in a in a pub. 
um, that, yes. that, that that has changed, right? I completely agree. And that frustrates me as well. Um, the way that, I, in fact, you know, worrying about critics and academics, but probably the general public are the worst spoilers of all. Not, you know, not generalizing. It's obviously, as you say, a lot of fans are super responsible, but there are a lot of people that don't care and they will just put anything on a feed and it will pop up. But I think what you made me think of there, Christina, was really interesting is the fact that, of course, we used to have appointment to view TV series and it would be on BBC Two at 8 p.m. and everyone would watch it all at the same time and then or whatever your channel is and then um you know and then it was fair game because everyone had seen it but now of course you know you can just watch anything whenever you want you, you're going to catch up with, with it on Sunday you're going to catch up with it when you have time on Wednesday and that is another reason that obviously we have this problem with tv series um you know it's kind of been alluded to before but but it's 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 a huge thing now that not everyone's watching it at the same time um then it, it's it's an issue right and it's really hard to navigate it's a really good point Do we have any more questions? Um, I was wondering about, because now we were talking about spoilers in social media and spoilers in real life, the person in the pub. Um, I was just like to pick up on what you said, Julia, in the beginning that um, your, your test readers, that they don't actually get spoiled in social media that much, but it's more of a social, thing and that's what I found out when I talked to um, to teenagers and asked them about spoilers that they said it's it's a question of um, of your empathy and your way of behaving in a social way if you have the feeling for the others um, it's, it's kind of respect for other people not to spoil things is it this impression you got in your conversations with the young people as well yeah that's what they told me that for example in at school or so uh, at, in the break when they speak about their their readings it's not common to spoil on on purpose and so it, it happens of course when they yeah talk about their favorite reads or so but no yeah there seems to be a spoiler etiquette or something like that even among young children already eight or nine year olds yeah, yeah that's really interesting because we were talking right now so much about knowledge. How much do I want to know? How can I um, control the knowledge that comes to me? Can I get it myself? Then it's a good thing. Is it um, is somebody imposing it on me? Then it's rather a bad thing. Um, it's yeah, it's so. not just that. They are, sorry, they are sometimes even asking for spoilers. So if they can't uh, yeah, deal with the suspense or so and, and want to know how is, is it worth reading the series or so, they ask their peers like what is going to happen in the end and start from that. No. So that's not an issue that professional film critics have to deal with. I think. <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> Please give me spoilers. <laughs> no, that would be very rare, I think. I don't think I've ever had that request. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe everybody needs some dinner and likes to watch something randomly or well planned on TV. I see Andrea has a question. Yes, so um, regarding um, film critics here, um, is there like a difference? So we, I, I think we were talking also a lot, a lot about um, like genre movies and also like movies that, that live um like from the suspense um but how do you how do you um go on about like um write, uh, writing a review for for an art house movie or like um for a movie that actually maybe needs some preparation beforehand like um i was just thinking about the green knight um from david lowry that that i watched last like last summer and um, I really enjoyed it, but um, I really had to dig into the source material afterwards to really understand it. And maybe it would have helped to know um, like a lot before actually going to the cinema. Um, so is there like a different mode of writing um, when it comes to art house movies or like I just um, like generalize them as art house movies? 
but um and like do do um switch between modes um and is there like a diffusion sometimes between different genres and the way you um try to avoid spoilers or not avoid spoilers i think with most art house films it's it's not a question that arises so with with most films i put on SRF 2 Kultur, it doesn't matter if you talk about the plot. You could even talk about the ending of a film and it wouldn't matter because it's it's not plot driven, most of these films. It it might happen. Uh, we had an example, Hiti number six, uh, compartment number six, a Juho Korsmanen's train film. That's a a young Finnish woman traveling with a young Russian from Moscow to Murmansk. It's a train film. It's been in Cannes, the last festival. So I there was for a moment wondering whether I should reveal that it's not the love story between the two, at least not the romantic love story, and I decided it doesn't really matter. It's not what the film is about. On the contrary, it makes it more interesting that you have these two young people in the same train compartment and it's not turning into a love story, but to something different. That makes it interesting. So with most of these films, plot doesn't matter. I think can think of one or the other Haneke film, Godin uh, Connu, there, there is a moment you wouldn't want to reveal because it's really a shock moment. But with most art house films, I think it's it's not a question that comes up. I think from my side, um, you know, per the, the, the first point you made, I think um, context is obviously really important um, for, for anything that's in less familiar territory. So if it's obviously not a big franchise, then it might be an art house film, then it's then it's great to give some context. And I think that's very, very different from a spoiler. But I would actually take a different view, as usual, a more strict view on the spoiler of compartment number six, because I would say, although there are many joys in that film, many, many joys in that film, one of them is not knowing which way it's going to go. Maybe Thank we... you. <laughs> I agree, but <laughs> even if I say it's not going to be a conventional love story, I think you don't know much. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I'm being, I'm being a bit of a pedant yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd actually like to return to Eberhard um, because we're near the end now of our discussion. And I would like to come back to your um, idea of academic spoiling. And I was wondering if maybe it's less about, you know, the classic spoiler, whatever that may be, we still don't really know that much about it. Um, but maybe it's more about giving context and about how much context do you need for um, um, to get in to get in into a text as academic as it may be. So sometimes it's better to to get your context, not everything at once. Do you think this? Could yeah. Be? yeah, maybe this would be something like like a like a like a plot, and in I guess in in, in academia and even. Um, and even in, 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 in the film studies, the, 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 the real interesting thing is not about spoilers, but in what is behind it, what ideas of telling, of talking about, um, about media, of uh, reception of media, of productions, of, of, of strategies um, of, of medias is, is what is been triggered by your question of the topic of spoilers. Um, the, the most in interesting questions lie, be lie behind it, I, I guess. And even, even though what we, we were, I guess we were hardly talking about is, is really the role of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the power of the recipient, of the, of the people, uh, of the readers, of the uh, people watching, uh, reading, and, and, and so many differences that are triggered um, with the with the with the with the topic of spoilers. But it's a, it's really a ein großes Feld. It's 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 really a, a huge topic. <laughs> if I may, when you when you brought this example about the abstract being being an actual spoiler. 
it, it made me laugh because it made me think of, of uh, Douglas Adams and 42. I mean, 42 is, is, is the result. It's the answer of everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, in itself, it isn't really a spoiler. It's just the answer. <laughs> and what would be interesting is the way, how do you get it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think to me with, with, with an academic abstract, I want that before I even wonder how they come to a conclusion. I want to know what the conclusion is. <laughs> and afterwards, I can follow their, their way of thinking. So mm -hmm. I think spo spoiling in an academic text, this is not something that's really possible because I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm not looking for suspense there. Like Christina, this is the classic reading of, 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 of academic, but I want, what, what I wanted to do, and I'm, um, um, I, I like that very much, um, but what I wanted to do is to push it a little bit further and, and, and to see, uh, to ask whether it's, it's more to academia than just telling what is. But academia is more. Academia could also be something of spend, something like uh, get some more dr dramaturgy and even more. But I guess it's a little bit late to talk about this right now. We can do this another time because actually there is quite some research on the relationship between fictional storytelling and academic writing, but we will do this another time in depth. So now we have one last question, um, Andrea. Uh, um, I just wanted to add something to Everhard's um, like, um, idea of the academic um, spoiler and only a short, short addition. Um, maybe it's still worth thinking about um, like an abstract as a spoiler because the way you like described um, the way your paper worked, um, the aim is to um, to have this effect, um, like like more of an emotional effect in the end that like yeah. compromises or like um, makes it easier to understand maybe the concept that you are talking about. And if you already know the concept, maybe it's not that easy to understand. Uh, for it, or like maybe you have more creative um, freedom to, to, yeah, I mean, maybe to transmit something that you want to, um, yeah, or, or like maybe it's like easier to, um, yeah, to make a concept like more comprehensive in that way. But yeah. um, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe even we could we could rethink the concept of of an abstract in um, making a workshop in writing experimental abstracts. Yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> like different. And, 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 uh, uh, and at the other end, I some, sometimes came across abstracts who uh, were nothing more than the first abstract of the article. <laughs> they were just cut off and <laughs> titled to be an abstract, but they were weren't abstracts, they were introductions. Uh, so. The lazy uh, version. <laughs> I, I just wanted worked. to say, because I sounded so critical of, of you, um, as, as an old person myself, I can say you're probably old enough that you could get away with it, because I feel like in academia, you have to follow the rules when you're young. And then like the fifth book or something, you can just, you know, go wild and tell your life story and do all the things and overthrow everything um, and be creative and do all those things. It's just as you're like struggling on tenure track or something, you, you do the abstract and you do the rules and you do everything the way it's supposed to. That sounds hopeful. <laughs> Maybe My next abstract I will write as a teaser. <laughs> already curious about that. If I may ask one last question, actually for the film critics again. Um, I was really wondering, I mean, I just watched um, a series on Netflix, Pieces of Her, and with my daughter, and we thought, oh my God, this is so crazy. It's just one twist after the other. And it's just about how do we get from, from one twist to the next? What do you think, how will this, um, Will this go on like this forever, or will there be some time when there will be some kind of 
people will relax about spoilers and do other things in, in films. Well, from in my experience, I think there is going to be a serious fatigue within the next few years. I think, uh, in my experience, I'm coming back to to classic films ever so often because I want to have something that goes from point A to point B without just making my tongue stick out all the time. So I, I, I'm getting tired of, of just being chased from one corner to the next. It's, it's interesting once in a while, but it's also, it's, it's like eating chips. It's, it's addictive, but you get sick if you, if you come to the third pack. And that's what happens with, at least with this kind of series that doesn't really have a, a grand arch. So I think Breaking Bad is one of the, the great examples of, of something that, that really ended and had the real ending as well. But most of these just fizzle out. And it's, it's not something you can enjoy unless you just go on with the next one. So I think that that's part of the problem. You need, you need a bigger, bigger way of, of telling stories. You can't just go from from point from one point to the next and and just paint it over. I, th yeah. I think it spoils itself. I would agree, and I think if if it may not sound a little bit self centered, but I think um, this has highlighted why it's quite useful to read reviews because I think most reviews of pieces of her would have said it's not really worth hanging on to the ending for those twists without revealing those twists. You could have written it without spoilers, but I personally watching that felt really cheated because I felt it was it was such lowbrow, badly written stuff, but yet it was compelling me to find out what happened at the end. So I would have been glad to have read a spoiler-free review of that series that would have said, oh. don't bother. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> okay, so I think we had a very interesting and multifaceted discussion tonight. And I thank you very much, Anna, Julia, Michael, and Eberhard for your contributions. And I thank everybody else who is still here for, for their questions and their interesting inputs into the discussion and I'm looking very much forward to continuing tomorrow. <laughs>